Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to this episode of Eco SY. Today we're going to be talking about testing, electrical testing in your distribution systems. Today we have with us a guest, Mr. Dan Lehman from Eaton, who's going to be helping us walk through uh, this topic. So welcome, Dan. Hope you're having a great day. Yeah, so far so good. Hope you are too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So before we start testing and we, and we get into that, we probably should have some basic information in place, right? So can you kind of walk through some of these items of, of, of typical information that users should have available before they actually begin testing? So I'm thinking through items like short circuit studies, coordination studies, arc flash analysis, you know, your load flow studies, and, and just a general harmonic analysis. So if you could kind of walk us through those to just give a high-level overview of, of what they are and why they're important, that'd be a great place to start. Yeah, absolutely. So as as you're trying to build an electrical system from scratch, it's a little bit easier to kind of hit some of these topics, you know, because you're base, you're basing a lot of your analysis on good information. So you know the age of the equipment, you know what, what equipment you have, you know what breakers you have, you know what fuses you have, you know what cables you're going to use. So with new construction, going through like short circuit and coordination studies, arc flash studies, load flow studies, and harmonics analysis, all of that is, is pretty, pretty simple to uh, – it's, it's pretty reliable. When you start talking about existing infrastructure and trying – to double back to do some of this, that, that that still might not be too bad if you have a good one-line diagram that's updated, and if you or if you have the ability to uh, you know kind of collect data on a site walk, you know. So none of these things are out of the out of the realms of being able to do on an existing uh, installation of equipment, but uh, might be a little bit more challenging. But so uh, when we start talking about like a short circuit and coordination study. Those uh, that that's really kind of talking about making sure that all of your breakers or fuses within your electrical system that all feed each other. That's what a system does. You know, you'll have a, a higher end part of your distribution system that feeds downstream equipment and might even feed downstream equipment from there. Uh, you want to make sure that if a fault occurs anywhere within that system whether it be at the main incoming service switch switch gear or switchboards, panel board, you want or or all the way to the downstream at the load, you want to make sure that breakers or fuses. Let, let's just talk breakers for the the sake of this. Um, you want to make sure that your breakers are going to trip appropriately, and you you want to make sure that. And, and by that I mean if you have uh, a a, a system where you have an incoming 480 volt breaker and then out of that panel it feeds a transformer and then out of that transformer it feeds a pa another panel board and then out of that panel board it feeds some outlet somewhere if you have a fault in that outlet you do not want your 480 volt breaker to trip I mean, you just don't, because if that 480 volt breaker trips all the way upstream, it's going to take out your entire facility. Okay, so you would want the breaker closest to the load to trip. And we do an analysis, we uh, collectively in the industry, power system engineers, will do an analysis to make sure that each breaker is going to trip appropriately when there's a fault present, depending on where that fault is in the system. We also make sure that at any given point, we're doing an analysis of the amount of uh, short circuit energy that, that can be generated. And we're, we're making sure that every single breaker within that power chain, within that power flow, is rated to handle that short circuit current. Okay, short circuit current is where you would have what would say like a bolted fault, where maybe a phase is bolted to B phase, or maybe 
maybe a particular phase is bolted in, uh, inadvertently to ground. Um, each breaker in the system has to be able to handle the amount of energy that would that would kind of sink to that fault. And so that's part of this as well, making sure that all breakers are rated appropriately. So that kind of covers short circuit co and, and coordination studies. Um, arc flash studies, you know, you want to make sure that you understand the available arc incident energy at each point in your electrical system. That has to do primarily with personnel protection, making sure that each of your employees that might be working in or, in or around that equipment will not be exposed to uh, high arc energies. And if they are, they would be uh, donning the appropriate PPE or staying outside of, of, of some limited approach boundaries of which you know we've kind of spent some time talking about in other podcasts. So arc flash hazard analysis kind of gives us that information. Uh, load flow is not commonly done all the time. I see load flow analysis when we're trying to add infrastructure or reduce infrastructure in existing facilities. So a load flow is kind of what it sounds like. So you, you basically look at uh, all of the loads within an electrical system and you can actually kind of follow where the current goes through that one line of the system. And you can kind of you can kind of understand that there might be some downstream panels or motor control centers that are taking most of the load, eating up most of that available current within the system, whereas you have some other parts of your distribution system that are underutilized. And and that would tell you that's where you can go and add load if you had you know you can add things to part of your electrical infrastructure and maybe not other parts and that's a load flow study and and the best way to do that is going to be with uh, uh actually going to the site and taking site measurements at different points in the system just so you know um doing a load flow off of a one line while it can be done a lot of assumptions have to be made and um, it'd be best to actually go out and put clamp-on meters out in the field and actually measure what's going on at different points in the system. Uh, and that, again, to, to tell whether you're open, whether you have too much uh, load in certain areas, or whether you, you know, whether you, whether you have capacity is really another way to look at it. Harmonic analysis. This is getting into some super high-level engineering, uh, but when you have a lot of motors a lot of inductive loads, a lot of drives. You know, there, there's a lot of uh, voltages that get put back on the line, and they call them you know, transients and harmonics. And, and there's people that will analyze all of that to try to make sure that um, uh, you're not going to be causing any sort of issues downstream with sensitive electronics or, or, or other, or, and, and that you still are having clean power throughout the system. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for unpacking those. I mean, there are definitely a lot of different studies and information that helps us ultimately keep us safe before we start working and, and testing uh, this distribution equipment. So before we move to testing, let's talk about the basic visual and mechanical items that we should look at or consider before any testing is done. Is there, are there any things that you'd like to, to point to our listeners to, to kind of walk them through this? Sure. You can you can uh, walk into an electrical room or take a look at any sort of electrical facility, and you can kind of gauge whether the equipment is in good working order or whether it's uh, it's in need of some TLC. And a lot of our testing, although we're calling it electrical testing, is testing the mechanical integrity of our system. It's testing the mechanical integrity of our bolted joints through copper bus. It's testing our electrical integrity of our cables and the cable runs. It's testing the, the mechanical integrity of our breaker mechanisms and making sure that they're operating properly. So it's important to understand that although we're performing electrical tests, we're actually testing the mechanics of this system. And so if you're looking at a piece of switch gear that seems to be in shambles and there's there's an inch of dust all over it and 
movement and not closing properly, you can kind of gauge that right off the bat, there, you're probably going to be encountering some issues. And it's, it's going to be more than just taking a measurement and saying whether it's good or bad. It's going to be qualified with, yeah, this breaker passed testing, but here are all the things that, that need to do to get this thing to be a reliable uh, system again. So, you, you know, that's kind of like at first glance. Now, when you walk into an electrical room at a data center, for example, or at a hospital, for example, um, those are typically going to be pretty immaculate to where you would feel comfortable, you know, dropping an M&M on the floor and picking it back up and eating it potentially. So, um, you know, th those, those rooms are well-maintained, and you can tell that although, you know, you might have to go in and do some testing or maybe we talk about preventive maintenance, it's not going to be a challenge. Whereas there's other types of facilities where it's, aged infrastructure and there's not great maintenance programs and so testing is going to be more of a challenge gotcha gotcha so i, I think i heard you right so if it's a, if the the right type of uh, e-room is maintained the five second rule does apply when it comes to dropping m&ms right yes sir <laughs> and it's a hard, it's a hard candy shell so that's that, that also helps that's right that's right so thank you for unpacking that so let's let's move on we're ready to test and we're just going to you know, on, on, on this uh, episode, we're going to assume that we have the right equipment, you know, that is calibrated equipment. You know, we don't have to necessarily go through that, but move through some test force. You know, we hear a lot of things out there, ins insulation resistance, resistance measurements, you know, dielectric testing, is ground resistance. Can you kind of walk us through some of the basic electrical tests that you recommend um, when you look at uh, distribution equipment? Yeah, absolutely. So what's critical to me if I'm a building owner with new equipment in it? I want to make sure that the contractors that installed my equipment installed it properly per code. I want to make sure that they have applied proper torque to all of my electrical connections. I want to make sure that there's no issues with any of the cables and wires that they ran. And I want to make sure that the manufacturer of that equipment built the equipment properly and that the breakers are working, okay? That that seems like a lot to ask for, but honestly, that's kind of my bare minimum expectation if I was going to be buying new equipment, okay? I want the contractor to be qualified to do good work, and I want the OEM equipment to be uh, in, in in the highest quality standards that exist. And, and so we perform tests. We collectively in the industry will perform tests in the field after installation to go through that. So we're looking at things like ductor testing is the term, but also termed as like a low resistance test or a low resistance meter test. And that's where we're gonna be actually using a meter, special meter, uh, to measure the resistance through the bus system, the copper and aluminum bus bar system within, within the electrical equipment. And what that's gonna do is that's going to tell us whether there's a whether all the joints uh, maybe maybe I'll take a step back when you have multiple sections of switch gear or switchboards they bolt together and at those bolted joints there's things called splice plates and those plates need to be bolted and torqued in place and that's typically done by the installing contractor and so we're going to be running a resist a low resistance check across those joints to make sure that we don't have a high resistance joint, which would imply a loose connection, okay? We're doing that. We're checking that. The meter is giving us uh, outputs in, in ohms or milliohms so that we're able to accurately make sure that, that that equipment is bolted in place properly. Insulation resistance is going to be doing a very similar type test, but, you know, we might incorporate the cables now into that system and make sure that all the cables are are isolated properly from phases and from ground. Uh, we'll make sure that, you know, we, we can pick up a small breakdown in the insulation. Uh, so if there was a nick in a wire, for example, we can pick that up with the testing that we do. And, you know, that's really not a good contract or bad contractor kind of comment. That's, that's life. 
you know, they're pulling miles and miles of cable through conduit, under duck bank, or through duck bank, and into cable tray. They're bound to have a nick in the in the insulation, and so this is a way for us to make sure that before we throw that switch and turn this thing on, there are no there are no shorted wires, and that every connection appears to be um, sound. Uh, you know, that's kind of the gear. Okay, when we start talking about the breakers and making sure that the breakers are going to operate properly, we can actually do that through two different methods. One is called primary injection or current injection testing, and the other is called secondary injection or secondary uh, secondary injection testing. Uh, when you have an electronic trip unit in the breaker, we can perform what's called secondary injection, where we plug in a test set into the trip unit itself and we run the trip unit through all of its trip functions okay and that is a podcast unto itself i'll just say that you know trip functions within trip units might be a, a great topic for uh maybe somebody a little bit um brighter than than me but so what you're going to do is you're going to run that trip unit through its long time, its short time, and its instantaneous and perhaps its ground fault protection schemes and make sure that it, as a trip unit, is sending signals to the breaker to actually open and close properly. And you'll actually trip the breaker. You'll have, you'll have to reset the breaker and, and run it through its testing. It's secondary injection. It's quick. It's, it, it, it validates the electrical system to a, to a point. And it's it's typically satisfactory. Uh, it, it's good enough to to know that the the, the breaker is going to function properly. There are certain times, and there are certain testing agencies that require primary injection, which is also a way to validate the breaker. But what that's doing is actually running through current through the primary contacts of the breaker itself. So when when we have a 100 amp breaker we're going to run actual current through that breaker and it's it's based on the trip curve of the breaker but you know if we were to run 150 amps through a 100 amp breaker it needs to trip the breaker within a certain amount of time and we're validating that time and we have test equipment that captures the, the exact moment that those breakers clear the, the fault what that's doing is validating the actual mechanical mechanism that's driving the breaker to open so in a in a in some breakers that might be a bimetallic element that they were actually heating up and making sure it actually moves the trip bar in the breaker and in other cases it's in larger breakers it's actually running current through what's called a current transformer which is inside of the breaker which then will send signals up to the trip unit to, to trip it out so we're making sure that you know, the breaker will truly operate under normal current conditions. So I think that kind of summarizes, that's a lot of info, but I think that kind of summarizes the fundamental on-site acceptance type testing that we would do for an electrical, uh, for an electrical product. That was, that was great, Dan. I mean, you really walked through the, all the different tests there, the, the, the injection testing. I'm glad you were, you were able to get to that. Uh, I know that gets brought up a lot. So, uh, let, let's let's take it to to the technicians that we're that we're trying to support here on Eco SY two. Say a breaker's tripping, and you've been called out to evaluate that situation, right? And you and you're the guy. So, what steps and tests would you take to 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 begin this diagnosis of the system? Sure. So, uh, obviously, let's assume that the people that are going out are qualified. Let's just make some general assumptions. Let's assume that the breakers are all in, in good working condition and the electrical room is, is in good shape. So we would want to just first look at the breaker itself. What type of breaker is it? Does it have an electronic trip unit? Does it have a what we call a bimetallic uh, trip unit? If it has a uh, or thermal magnetic trip unit, if it has an electronic trip unit, many of them are equipped with what's called a cause of trip indication. And what that means is that if you walk up to a breaker that's tripped, you can actually look at the trip unit or plug in a test set to the trip unit, and it'll tell you why it tripped. That's pretty great technology, and most manufacturers have moved towards standardizing on electronic trip units. Uh, for many reasons, but but one of them from a customer standpoint is that 
that's just a phenomenal value. Um, so, okay, it, 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 you'll be able to pull that data out if it's an electronic, an electronic trip unit, and it'll tell us why it tripped. And then you'll have to start kind of doing some investigative work from there. Like, what is the load? So what type of load is it? Is it, is it, a, is it a motor load? Is it a lighting load? Is it, uh, is it feeding outdoor equipment? You know, just kind of understanding what that breaker is feeding. Um, is it tripping quickly? Like as soon as it energizes, is it tripping immediately or is it tripping over time? You know, there's two different ways that a, that a breaker operates. It'll operate what's called instantaneously, which means that if a breaker sees a short circuit somewhere, it will, it will trip immediately. You will try to close the breaker and it will immediately trip. Okay. That is you know, a good indication that you might have a shorted cable, you might have a shorted motor lead, you might have some failure that should be easily detectable downstream. If it's tripping over time, that's the other type of function a breaker does is it'll allow over current. So it'll, it'll, it'll allow current to run through above its ratings for a certain amount of time and then it will trip. So that tells us that there might be a degradation of a load downstream. Maybe there's a stuck motor bearing that is causing the motor to spin slower than usual, causing it to generate or pull more current, which, you know, might overdo to the breaker and eventually cause it to trip. So you have to start asking those types of questions. What is the load? What are the conditions? Is there a lot of moisture in the air? Is this outdoor equipment and you see signs of water? Um, you, you need to understand what conditions this breaker is in. Is it, in a, is it outside in a very high ambient temperature? Meaning, are, is the breaker possibly inside the enclosure, um, which is typically 10 to 15 degrees hotter than it is outside? Um, is, is it potentially that it's getting up over 100 degrees Fahrenheit inside of that enclosure? And if it is, that breaker is going to potentially nuisance trip. So what are the conditions of the breaker? And then as a kind of a last resort, you know, when you're actually getting into troubleshooting, it, how does the torque look on the load cables of that breaker? How does the torque look on the line side of that breaker? You know, does everything appear to be mechanically sound? Because a loose connection from, on the cable end of that breaker or on the, on the line side of that breaker, either one, can cause excessive heating and cause the breaker to trip. So it's not like a really simple answer, but you have to kind of start looking at a systematic approach, which includes what's the load? What are the conditions? Is it well maintained? Right, right. Thank you, Dan, for walking us through that. That was very helpful. So, you know, Eco asks why. We always like to get to the why in every episode if we can. So why should our listeners care and start working towards implementing a testing system for their electrical distribution equipment? Well, I, I think the proof is in the pudding, and I, I have, uh, I've had experience where brand new equipment was shipped from, uh, from factories and arrived on site, and it was a, uh, an assisted living facility, uh, which had a lot of downstream panel boards and, and some switch boards, you know, low voltage, 480 volt systems, and brand new equipment installed, and, and the, the installing contractor opted to, uh, to not have any sort of on-site uh, engineering support during startup. So there was none of this testing done. And there, uh, there had been some what was deemed nuisance tripping on the main breaker, uh, which was feeding this entire assisted living facility. So quite a... Uh, quite a large operation with many, as I've said, many distributed buildings and, and systems. And the main, which was a 3,000 amp main, kept tripping. And what it, what we found, once they actually ended up calling uh, us out to come and investigate, what we ended up finding was that there was a shorted cable on a downstream panel board, way down the electrical system. And because there was really no study done, and there was really no testing done, we found that that main kept tripping and it was, you know, right when they're trying to get the, uh, COA, no, the COO certificate of occupancy. So they're trying to actually get paid 
and they're at the last minute where the electrical inspectors are there and they can't keep the main shut. And honestly, a coordination study coupled with a little bit of on-site testing would have mitigated that entire concern. But what ended up happening is they ended up having to postpone and delay energization by a few days to get the testing done and then to get proper settings put in the breakers and to fix the issue that they found in a panel board downstream. So the proof is in the pudding, as I say. Absolutely. That was a great story, Dan. I mean, that, that, that tied it all together for us on why the, why testing is important, what it can do for you, the impact it can make in our system. So thank you so much for, for again, as much knowledge as you brought to our listeners here. We definitely think that, uh, you know, a lot of value was brought. So thank you again, Dan, and really appreciate your time today, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com. 